Hello, everyone. Ryan Aho here, and uh, we're bringing you the One to Go show. And before we get started, I, I guess I want to introduce my partner in crime here, Bert. Bert Lehman, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. How, hey, how good. about you? I'm <laughs> doing awesome. Doing awesome. Well, hey, uh, we're, we're going to start off this episode. I want to thank the folks over at Where's Machine. You know, get a hold of Chad, get a hold of the crew over there. And uh, they got that cornhole game. Puka keeps talking about that cornhole game. Puka, <laughs> I mean, do you play cornhole, Bert? Do you play that? I've I've played it before. I don't do it on a regular basis. I don't know that I'd want to keep score, but they got this neat deal on there where you can keep score. I think I don't want to because I would lose. But uh, you know, they got it's crazy how much stuff they have over at Weir's Machine. They got all that kind of stuff. And then of course I raced, so they have some amazing products, right? And you know, the re products, I'm talking everything from tools to make it easier to race. I'm talking bird cages. I ran their bird cages, you know, lots of brackets, lots of frame outs, you name it. But get a, get a hold of the folks over at Weir's Machine. This is a time of year, too. You know, season's winding down for a lot of people. You're going to be looking for inventory, looking for things to do for next year. You know, up your game. You know, get some products from Weir's. You'll be glad you did. They treat everybody right. And uh, a lot of the top cars out there, they already run Weir's Machine products on their cars. So I want to thank the guys over there. And, you know, let's start out. You know, hey, there was very little dirt late model racing at all in our area. In fact, the Wasoda area, there was none because of Red Clay Classic. They canceled. But, Bert, you had some on your side of the state, a little south of you, of course. But uh, there yep. was some stuff going on. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, down at uh, Wilmot Speedway, uh, the Dirt Kings uh, had their uh, final race of the season. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, they got – half of the well I, I don't know if it was half i'm not sure how long the feature was supposed to be but they got 15 laps in and then it started raining and uh so then uh that ended the program but uh taylor scheffler uh led all 50 started on the pole led all 15 laps and he was declared the winner uh but justin ritchie uh won the championship uh he won by i have it written down here somewhere <laughs> Uh, 20 points over Ron Berna and 24 points over Troy Springborn. So uh, uh, Justin Ritchie is uh, uh, the first champion other than Nick Avalink. Uh, Nick won the first three championships in that series. Uh, he didn't follow the series on a regular basis this year. Uh, so Justin Ritchie is your winner. Uh, you know, it's a good championship for Justin. Uh, he's been back in a late model for probably about three years now after being out of a late model for several years so what was uh, he running what was he running during that time off uh he would run a modified periodically he didn't race anywhere full-time during that time was uh, he better he, in the late models before or after being in the modified oh uh, well uh when he was in a late model before racing the modified and he won uh uh the sports or limited late model track championship at Shano. And he was also a uh, Wissota late model. I think they're still Wissota at that time, won the track championship at Shano in the Wissota division. He actually tied with Troy Springborn for the championship at Shano that year. So he was co champion. Uh, but uh, when I interviewed him, when he uh, got back into the late model racing, I asked him why he got back in. And he said, Well, the car owners called him up and asked if he would drive their car. And he said, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's pretty hard to turn somebody down when uh, they ask you to drive their equipment. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. I mean, that it doesn't get any better than that. Hey, do you want to race my car for free versus you pay for all? No, yeah, I'll do that. And late models is a, there's a great group of late models over there. That dirt Kings deal is pretty cool. And like you said, uh, winning the championship, Nick didn't run for it this year, but, Richie actually had a pretty good year. I mean, yeah, I mean, he ran pretty well outside of the Dirt King stuff. I've seen him have some really good performances as well. So hats off, of course, to him. And pretty close uh, for second there. You said only four points difference between second and third? Yes. Yeah, only four point difference between second and third. So, so pretty competitive uh, yeah. then overall. So very competitive, competitive yes. Good deal. Did you get to watch any of the race? Was it was it televised? Was there any? Video I didn't coming? see any of it. I don't know if it was televised anywhere. Um, I do have a rundown. Uh, I mean, Justin Ritchie finished third in the in the race, and Troy Springborn finished fifth, and Ron Berna finished sixth. So the three cars that were 
battling for the championship all finished uh, in the top six. So uh, uh, definitely, you know, the cream of the crop rises to the top. And uh, so it looks like they had 23 late models there, which is a, a good car count uh, for uh, early October. <laughs> More than they had at the legendary 100. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> so, Was there any so, Illinois guys that came up? Because I know Wilmot is, you know, basically not real far from the Illinois border. Did they get any Southern cars kind of migrate up for that show? Or was it pretty much mostly the followers? Uh, looking at the rundown, there's so, somebody by the name of Matthew Schultz. I'm not sure where he is from. Um, and Dan Schlieper did race uh, in that race. Uh, he finished 18th. Um, so, that must uh, have been, was that a DNF or does it say prob probably that? Uh, it, it doesn't say. Um, so, um, you know, it, you know it, I did see that uh, uh, Jason, who's uh, him and his wife who run the Dirt Kings, they had posted that, uh, you know, they were very happy with how the season went. I mean, considering the COVID and everything. And they're already working on plans for uh, 2021. So uh, we'll see what they uh, have the what they come up with for 2021. Uh, you know, it's a good series. I hope they have a few more races in eastern Wisconsin this uh, next year. I mean, this year was understandable because with COVID, you just kind of had to take take races wherever you could get them. And uh, so hopefully next year there'll be uh, some more in the eastern side of the state. And uh, you know, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was a great series. I did not make it to any, but I'm going to try to do that next year. And of course, I went down to Madison Speedway in Minnesota. I was going to go, you know, I said on last week's show, I'm heading north. I'm going to the Red Clay Classic, dress warm. And then COVID hit, right? I mean, it's been here, but they shut down the whole county up there and it sucked. I mean, they worked their tails off trying to put that show together. That Red Clay Classic is such a huge deal, but you know, it is what it is. We'll have to look forward to the next the next one. But I went down to Madison. I got a hold of Barb and Troy down there, and they said, hey, come on down. You know, you, we'd love to have you announce. And got to do that a little bit with Dave Nurmi up there. That was a blast. They had over 160 cars the first day. I think just a couple less than that the second day. But uh, did you get a chance to watch any of that on there, on, on Dirt Race Central? I watched some of them. I didn't see all of the features, but I did see so – I saw – uh, Sabraski win his two features at one night and uh, after watching him <laughs> after watching him race those two races now that was uh, was that the first night or the second night that was the first night first so after night. night one he, he was at 44 <laughs> on the year and I said man he's gonna get the 50 uh, I don't know because the second day he went out there and Les Dolman put a beat down on the boys actually he was way ahead they got into a lot of traffic and uh, what a great finish at the line. Dan Nisalki, um, who also has a dirt dueler, and Sabraski chased him down in lap traffic. And at the line, I, I bet he couldn't have beat him by half a car. Sabraski got to the outside of Dolman for the lead in lap traffic there. But Les Dolman, interesting about Les Dolman, you probably heard that name at some point, haven't you? It kind of sounds familiar. Yeah, he's from down by Winona. He's ran mods. He's ran lates. He's ran everything. But Les dolman has been around for a long time. He owns Dirt Dueler Chassis, and he has won a feature in the in each of the last six decades. He said he won his first ever feature as a 13-year-old in 1977. So wow. pretty cool feat there for Les. I mean, <clears throat> I call him the mad scientist because he's super analytical. He's always trying to be that unique guy, bodies and all kinds of stuff. So pretty cool. And then so Sebraski got second, and then in the in the mods. He went to line up for the heat race, and it started popping and banging and this and that, and fire coming out the carburetor. He didn't get to start the heat. <laughs> he was supposed to start second row, you know, and uh, he ended up having to come out for the feature. He started dead last. I think he rolled up into the top ten. Brian Hobbin, he has won the track championship there each of the last four years in a row. He's won. He won every single feature coming into this weekend at Madison except for one, the final night of the year. Then Sabraski won, and then he finally won his first Madtown showdown. So hats off to Brian Hobbin for getting that done. But uh, not a couple other things there, street stocks. You know, we talked about that street stock series all year, right? That Stephanie street stock series. I'm telling you what, by far, 
the best racing of the weekend there was the Wasota Street Stocks. There was a little over 30, like 33, 34 of them. Everybody that was good in Wasota Street Stocks was there except for Johnny Carter. The first night, uh, Parker Anderson, he's a Wisconsin boy over from Phillips, so not real far from you, actually a couple hours maybe, it's kind of central Wisconsin. He came from ninth and got her done the first day, passed Bogle, passed a bunch of guys. The second day. Yep, I did see that. That was good. And then Eric Riley, who he got second in that Steph at Street Stock Series, he started eighth. And he put a move on them guys. He split them for the lead coming off of turn number two. And he looked really good. I mean, I've seen that guy's it's either he's in the back <clears throat> or he's right in the front. And he put a heck of a show on. So that was fun. And then did you get a chance to see that Pierce Stock roll over? Yes, I did. That was that was pretty nasty. It looked like he uh, he hooked the berm on the inside, and yeah, what it, he had to go over at least three times, I would say. Yeah, he had hard. So his <clears throat> name is Jeremy Grenader, and uh, in the feature, the second day in the pier stocks, he dove down to the inside. It looked to me like he clipped that berm too. I don't know if there's a tire down there, but the car just took off. The roll cage came down on him. Right, it didn't completely crush, but it came down enough to where he smacked his head, he split his helmet, and either his L6 or his L7 vertebrae, which is high up, it's kind of I think it's one of the the higher up ones. He actually fractured it. So, wow. yeah, it was like a 45 minute caution there. It was absolutely excruciating because nobody really knew what was going on. But he walked out of the hospital here. I think it was Monday. I think he walked out of the hospital, so that was good. But he said. They asked how he was. They talked to Troy from Madison. He says, how you feeling? He goes, well, I'm, I'm sore, I'm tired, and I'm retired, <laughs> is what he said. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like he wants to get back in a car, but glad to see he's up walking around and stuff. That could have been – it was bad. It was bad, but it could have been a whole lot worse. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Midwest Mod Racing was pretty good as well. The first night, Cody Lee, um, he got her done. He looked really good in that 50 car. The second night, Matt Baker got her done. And Cody Lee had a little bit of a – there was a little controversy there on the second day. He was running up in, like, uh, top five, six, or somewhere in that neighborhood. All of a sudden, Cody Lee spins around in turn number three and goes off the end of the racetrack, and the yellow comes out. And on the yellow, Cody Lee tags onto the back of the field because he knew. It's like, well, I spun out. They're going to call it on me. I'm going to go to the back. He went to the back. <clears throat> a couple minutes later, they're still not green yet. They're – they're like trying to organize stuff. I'm like, what are they doing? Why is the caution taking so long? Well, the official called it on Darren Engeser, who is a guy that Cody, in my eyes, you look at it, there, you know, the video clip is here, folks. You look at it. You make the call on this one. Nothing against Cody because Cody <laughs> went to the back. But they called it on Engeser. And I, I got to be honest, I think he got a raw deal on this one. I mean, it happens. Things happen fast. But they put the 11 car to the back and, he was not, not a happy camper after that deal. Did you get a chance to see that? Yeah, I, I did see that, and I saw it, and then I rewound to watch it again, and my initial reaction was that I thought the 11 may have come down a little bit on him, uh, but then I watched it at least four or five more times, and I, the more I watched it, the more I didn't think that you could call the caution on the 11 car. I I, I – I mean, it was probably more of just a racing incident, but in that case, the 50 car spun around, so he's the one who should go to the back. Yeah, um, that's what I thought for sure. <clears throat> you know, and it's not like he yard sailed him. He didn't take them out. He didn't rack them. Oh, he just right. spun out. He just overdrove. Right. And, right. and the part that I – the part that really – I'm like, man, is Cody went to the back. When the yellow came out, Cody, he just made his way to the back of the field like, hey, it's on me. I went to the back, and – Next thing you know, 50, get back up into your spot there. This is on the 11. He had to have been thinking, like, what? No, oh, really? <laughs> you know? But I'm sure he's got plenty of bad calls in his day, too. So you, you, you take them when they come to you like that, I well, guess. It, and the 11 cars then did stop on the front stretch. Uh, he must have wanted to wonder – must have asked what's going on here. <laughs> right. I, I talked to Darren, and let's just say he was not real impressed with the call. <laughs> but, you know, I talked to him a couple days later. He's like, you know – it's, it's one of those things. It pissed me off. It really did because he had a shot to run right up in the top five there. But it's, it's part of the racing deal is, is what mm -hmm. it is. But I want to get back to the, to the safety deal. Now, 
first, I'm going to start by saying this. I don't know what kind of helmet this guy has. I don't know how his seat was mounted. I don't know if his seat was too high. I don't know any of that, okay? You know, but the fact is his cage came down, smacked his head. You know, it was a bad deal. But it got me to thinking about a lot of race cars I've seen <clears throat> over the years where, where a guy has to wonder, do most drivers even think about safety? Do they even think about it? And, and do most tracks even look at things to make sure that certain things are mounted safely? In most of the areas I'm at, the answer is no and no, right? And I've seen cars out there where people's heads are even with or even sometimes above the roll cage. Guys, guys and gals, if you're racing and you're in that situation, take some time this winter, go over to a fab shop. If you can't do it yourself, have somebody – raise the roll cage, do something, and make sure your seat's mounted properly, the seat belts, steering wheel, steering shaft, that stuff's got to be good. And because once it's done, it takes a little bit of time to get this stuff done right, but it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it to go out there and race at a high level. I mean, we're talking a pure stock, right? That's one of the slowest cars on the racetrack, and this dude almost died. I mean, he, he broke his L, I think it was his L7, but he fractured his L7, crushed split his helmet right split the helmet imagine if he was in a modified late model something going twice as fast man it just it's just not worth it do you see i mean do they pay attention to that stuff very close i mean are you aware of that in eastern wisconsin well i know like the uh opening weekend at, at channel speedway anyway they always at least they did in the past they would you all the drivers would have to bring, they'd have to get their car inspected. So they they would inspect different aspects of the car. You had to bring your helmet with, with you because they would check the date because I think there's certain dates that uh, for the helmet or make sure it's the right uh, type of helmet. And then they would check the seat belts also because I know the seat belts do have dates on them. Yeah, um, so, so the helmets, they got like a Snell rating. Okay. You know, and there's a certain year. <laughs> And, and you're exactly but, right. No, I've been to a couple tracks that have two, but not most, not most. But, I mean, they only they only do that on the first night. So, I mean, I don't know I don't know if they do that any other weeks during the season. And so if a new driver shows up at the track, but they weren't there on opening night, you know, do they get inspected? You know, that, that I don't know. But, uh, you know, one thing also is I know there was a discussion on Facebook several years ago uh, in this area about, uh, uh, you know, drivers should use, should, should purchase a Hans device and they should wear a Hans device when they race, you know, it's weekly racing, it's local racing, but it's still dangerous. You should have a Hans device. And I, I can remember, uh, some four cylinder drivers chimed in. Well, I just raced four cylinders. I can barely afford that. I can't afford to buy a Hans device. And, my my thought well, was, well, then you really can't afford to race because that should be one of the required things um, to race. I mean, and in that regard, yeah, I think sometimes safety does take a back seat, you know, based on cost. And I, I also think there is some mentality out there that, you know, I race one of the lower divisions, you know, I don't need all that safety equipment and, um, you know, you need all the safety. I mean, every time you stretch, I mean, I, I've never raced well, except for in a media race, <laughs> but, uh, did you, know, you win? Did you win? No, I did not win. <laughs> but, uh, one of the drivers I raced against was, uh, Brian no Noble, the former linebacker for the Packers. Cause he was a correspondent for a TV station in green Bay. So he was, did you rough to... him up? Did you at least? No, get... he was actually, he, I was the last, once he would have passed me, uh, I was the last car to get lapped. I mean, that's how <laughs> he was, he was just driving like balls to the walls. Uh, but then his car broke. And uh, so technically I think I should have, because I was the only car in the lead lap then. So I think I should have been the only car in the lead lap, but it was all fun. I can't watch the tape though, because I've watched it once and I'm going really, really slow. And <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, cause I'd go into the corner and I could feel the car slide. So, Oh, I'm doing all right. And then I watched the tape and it's like, no, I wasn't. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but, it's like Talladega nights. It's like, what was it? What? Were those the other cars? 
oh my god i'm going i'm not going fast <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean back to the safety aspect of it though you know just because you're racing in a lower division doesn't mean that you can't get hurt and sometimes i think um, you know, especially the four cylinders, those things scare the heck out of me because, you know, I don't know how well built some of those are. And, uh, you know, you can never, never cinch on, on safety. I mean, safety should be, cause every time you strap into the car, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. I think there's a line that the doctor says in the movie days of thunder, when you're on the track with, with egomaniacs <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen <laughs> i'm more afraid of losing than i am of getting hurt that's the mentality of a race yeah. car driver and that's what yeah. i was so that's going to lead me to this i got like a, i got a couple things here that i want to say really quick so number one race tracks if you're a promoter you're a tech guy you're watching this show right now i truly believe and i get it i get it because sometimes it's hard to have time to do all this and there's o there's only so many hours in a day and there's not it's hard to find help i get it at a racetrack but I truly believe that at the beginning of the year, the opening night, you should attack every single car for safety. Make sure their fuel cells are in the right. We've seen fuel cells fall out. Make sure that their seat belts are not only the right date, but mounted properly. Their helmets are good. They're, I've seen people racing with race suits. They've got big holes in them and stuff. It's like, are you serious? Come on, right? Check this stuff to make sure it's good. Make sure. I remember back in the day, they, they did brake checks where we had to drive and hit the brakes to make sure all four tires locked up. They don't do that stuff anymore. Check that stuff, okay? Number two is when new cars come into that track for the first time, make sure that you go over there and do all them safety checks with those cars. Have stickers that say, okay, you're certified or however you got to do it. But we're talking, I mean, it doesn't take that long. I mean, the first night we kind of sucked for a tech guy, but that's it is what it is, okay? The second thing, race car drivers, I get it. I get it. You want to win and you want to spend your money, what's going to make you faster, but pay attention to safety. And third, sponsors. If you're a sponsor of a race team or if you're looking to sponsor a race team, maybe think about that. Maybe look at some, you know, ask that driver, do you have a Hans device, right? Or, or there's a lot of different stuff out there, different products that are similar to that, you know. But maybe it'd be a good idea to sponsor a certain driver or whatever with their safety equipment for the year. I've seen sponsors buy people new helmets and race suits and all that, you know, so maybe that's a way to kind of make sure that driver's safe. I think that Cody Lee sponsor, I think it's uh, um, the trucking company, the trucking, I, I can't remember uh, what the name of Garbridge, Gar Garber I think it's Garbridge Trucking. Every single year they buy that's what they buy their drivers is safety equipment. So that's pretty cool. You don't see that all the time because drivers ain't going to do that. But something that should not be overlooked because something that happens that fast, I'm talking that quick, could change somebody's life forever. And simply we just don't think about it. So that's well, what and, Go ahead. and another thing is, you know, once you have your safety equipment, take care of it. Uh, you know, you know, don't don't let it get all you know, dirt, you know, clean it up. And like, I know one thing when I was on MJ's crew, you know, you wash the, you have to wash the race car. You know, we would always take the seat belts out before you wash it because I mean, you don't want the, you know, the walk, if you leave your seat belts in and continue to wash it with water, you know, that can affect the, the fabric and everything too. So, uh, you know, just little things like that, you know, you just have to be aware of. Yeah, it, they always say, you know, a safe, safety first. That's not always the case. It's always been winning first. But what, when you see something like that, you're thankful that that person didn't get hurt worse than he was. So that's going to lead us to the next segment here. We're going to kind of recap because there wasn't much on the local scene, right? Mantown Showdown, you had the deal over there, you know, with uh, with the Dirt Kings. But the national recap, this, of course, brought to our, brought to us by our friends over at Dirt Track Supply in Watertown, South Dakota. You know, talk to talk to Trevor, talk to Ron. You know, they have everything. They have all the safety equipment we're talking about. They have every single bit of it over there at Dirt Track Supply, whether it's helmets, Hans devices, seatbelts, seats. I mean, you name it, gloves, shoes, all of it. They have everything that you need. And if you have questions on how to maintain this stuff, how to mount it in your car, how to do all that, those guys have been around racing for a long time. They build aero chassis over there. They can help you with that. And also, they have just, you know, they have every product. We talked about wares before. They have wares. 
but they have every product that you can imagine. So get a hold of them guys at, I guess it's dirttracksupply.com, or you can just call Dirt Track Supply over in Watertown, South Dakota. They ship, you know, and they actually go to all the different tracks in that area with the, with the parts truck as well. But great group of people over there. Now, the Lucas Oil scene, Friday night looked like it rained out. Mother Nature, winter, Friday night. Did you, Bert, did you watch the feature Saturday night, which would have been the Pittsburgher 100. Did you, did you watch that? The yeah, I, I, watched, I watched the highlights of the feature uh, on Dirt on Dirt. And uh, so, yeah, they were, they were uh, popping tires. <laughs> yeah, they, they um, posted who won. But the official winner of that deal, who's your tire? Um, they won because, I mean, it was locked down, one lane, two, two train, rubber. I mean, I've seen a lot of people pretty upset about that deal. And I think there was only three cars two that were running up front, but I think only three cars went right to the end or actually went to the end and didn't change their right rear tire. But uh, what, who, you know, what, what did you get out of that race? What did you see? Any highlights that you saw? Well, I know you like it because uh, a mod guy won, uh, Ricky Thornton Jr. Uh, I watched the interview with him and he said that uh, um, they went with a harder tire and, it was pretty obvious that they went with a harder tire because he was able to go the whole race uh, without changing tires. I did find it a little surprising um, because uh, Devin Moran uh, led a good portion of that race. And then uh, uh, McCready also was running up high and they both had, had uh, flat tires, but both of them said that, that it wasn't an issue with, with uh, tread that they think that they ran something over on the track. Um, and I didn't realize this at the time, but uh, um, McCready actually changed both of his rear tires. And uh, but so he was able to, to get back up to, I'm not quite sure where he finished in the final rundown. Oh, he was still a ways back, but it was late when he pitted because he had just taken the lead uh, and then he had pitted. But Josh Richards also pitted and he, he came back. He, he was battling for the lead before that. And then he had a tire go down, came back in, and finished second. So that was a very good run for Josh Richards. He was and, past uh, the whole race. I mean, he yeah. looked really good. Yeah, like the first 10 to 20 laps were pretty racy. Him and Devin Moran were, were kind of battling side by side. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, Hoosier, Hoosier Tires definitely uh, – uh, was the winner there and i mean that's a big track <laughs> that's a big ha is that a half mile or even bigger than a half mile? It, it looked bigger to me i mean that place <laughs> looked like it might have been a five eighths mile or something i think they call it a big half but you know a hundred lap race there is there any other dirt late model hundred lap race you know on the open series that has a fuel stop or is that the only one that's the only one that i can think of yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. A fuel stop on lap 40, I'm like, I've never seen that in an open race before. I was I was kind of taken back by that. I was kind of surprised, but maybe it's because the track is so big that Could maybe be. they just couldn't have made 100. <clears throat> I'm not really sure. But, you know, what's your thoughts as a fan on that, on the fuel stop? I mean, I look at it and it's like, okay, if they can't make 100 laps, and they got to have a fuel stop. Myself, I'd rather be like, well, how many laps can they make? Can they comfortably make 75? Well, let's go 75 laps and get rid of the fuel stop altogether. What, what do you think? Uh, I don't have an issue with the fuel stop. I mean, from a fan's perspective, depending on where they do the, you know, because if you, if you do it right in front of the grandstand, it's actually kind of cool for the fans to be able to see how they put fuel into these cars and that sort of thing. Um, so for, from that aspect of it, I don't mind it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it does uh, – I don't necessarily like fuel stops where it's going to help dictate who the winner is going to be. Um, so, you know, if, if a driver has a big lead and then, you know, although if you know there's going to be a fuel, fuel stop, you know, drivers can kind of take it easy for the first 40 laps. And then, you know, I'm not going to get too far behind because we have a fuel stop. As long as I stay in the lead lap. <laughs> right. So. Right. Yeah. That is a key. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of interesting, but overall, I mean, Hoosier Tire wasn't the official winner. The 20 RT becomes the 20th winner in 2020 in the Lucas Oil season. So, and then he has a World of Outlaw win, didn't he? he went over in Davenport, right? Yeah, he he has at least one World of Outlaw win, 
and then, well, then we thought he should have had two, but his transponder was in the wrong spot. True, true. I forgot about <laughs> that one. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, hats off to, I guess, the 20 RT, Ricky Thorne Jr., one hell of a race car driver. So, now we'll shift gears. We'll go over to the World of Outlaw Late Models. Did you get a chance? They had two shows. They were at Cherokee, and then they were, I believe, over at the 411. Did you get a chance to watch any of yeah, that? Yeah, I, I watched both of those races, and uh, Brandon Overton won at Cherokee. Uh, I guess the driver of note here is uh, Chris Madden finished third in that race, and then won at 411 Motor Speedway, and the interesting thing about that is Chris Madden's with another new team, his own team. So right. this this is what his fourth team now this season alone. So and you know he left the team in the middle of the year last year, didn't he, or the year before? So well, yeah, it's like he, these musical chairs is what he's <laughs> playing. I'm not really sure. Yeah, so he, he, I don't know if. Uh, you know, he's hard to deal with or if, or he just doesn't get along with other people or, or what the deal is. But yeah, he's been, he's definitely been playing musical chairs this year. Well, and the talent is there. I mean, the guy can flat out wheel a race car. He's one of the best drivers in dirt late models. I mean, the, the guy is immensely talented, but if you look at jobs across the country, usually don't, people don't lose their jobs because because of lack of being able to do the job it's because of attitude right so and i don't know i i don't i don't know the whole story but it seems to me like man he just jumps around a lot maybe there is something where he can't get along with people and that's why he's got his own thing i think his brother's kind of the big money behind his racing deal now but but i mean obviously every time he switch gears right every time he jumps in a new car he wins races i mm -hmm. mean every single time so i mean the guy can flat out wheel but uh over 10 one night one and that turned out to be his fifth straight World of Outlaw victory. You know, he had a couple of World of Outlaw shows where he didn't go to, but his the fifth straight that he entered, he won. And uh, that ended, of course, on Saturday night when when uh, Madden beat him. So Overton's been he's been really good in that deal. And it looked like uh, Madden won Ricky Weiss. Second place finished there yep. on Saturday. So great run for Ricky. And, of course, Brandon Shepard, he got second and third. So on the podium both nights but you know the the racing was okay but the the fact of the matter is uh the cream rises to the top brandon shepherd was in the top three both nights he's got a monstrous point lead i mean that deal's all but over right now yeah. <laughs> but uh mad is it that's an interesting deal and uh it'll be interesting to see you know what happens next year because he always seems to jump into something i don't really know what his deal is there well you know, speak and then i wanted to also mention a driver who has impressed me the entire year and had two good, really good races as Ross Bales finished fifth in both of those races. Right. Um, you know, so for a regional driver to finish fifth in back-to-back -back outlaw races, that that's pretty good. That That is solid. I mean, he's got, it'd be good to see it. Who's he driving for right now? Is he, is Bales in that kind of rental car deal or is he got, what is he you know, got going on? I think he's with big frog motorsports or something like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it'd be um, interesting to see if he ran more, if he followed one of the series, or if he, there, I mean, there seems to be a lot of bigger shows in that area that aren't World of Outlaw, that aren't Lucas. So maybe he'll just stick around there, but it'll be interesting to see what he does next year. Yep. Now, the Gumbo Nationals, kind of an interesting name. Did you watch any of that? I did watch that, actually, and that's actually a cool little track. Um, it's got a very low side and a very high side. And if you take the high side, you're definitely uh, driving a longer distance than if you're down on, on the low level. And also, if you're driving the high side, it's a little treacherous up there if uh, you don't hit, hit it right. Um, but, uh, I mean, it was interesting because everybody was, you know, driving on the low side. And then there was a caution and everybody jumped up to the high side. And... Uh, I mean, they're, they were actually bouncing off the walls to help them get around the corners. I mean, even Mr. Smooth, Billy Moyer, had sparks flying off, off of his race car because he would take the, take the wall with the rear end of his car. But, and so, he won and night that, number two, man. It's great yeah. to see him back in victory lane. <laughs> what is that, number 840, right, yep. for, for 840. Billy Moyer? So, 
how did he do the first night? I know Neil what was it Neil Baggett or Baggett or Badgett. Or I'm not sure how he did. I he didn't won. watch the first night. I just watched the second night. Um, yeah. You know, another thing I got out of that, did you pay attention? My buddy Jeff, who's our late model analyst, he says, you got to see this. Did you see where the fans were coming out of turn four? Yeah, after you had sent me the text message, I kind of paid attention to that. And, yeah, they had pickup trucks backed right up to the to the fence, and they were sitting in the back of the pickup, in the pickup truck bed and just watching the races there. So two things I can recall on that, right? Because, I mean, they're literally, you can go on Dirt on Dirt. You can check this out if you got a subscription. They're, like, right on the fence, and they're, like, standing against the fence. I mean, and the car, and the fence is right on the wall, and the groove was right on the wall. So, I mean, like, literally, they're this – they couldn't have been that far away from the right rear cars as they're coming around turn four, right? It was crazy. But I remember when I was a kid, I was down at Cedar Lake, and Mike Bear and Cadding, Jerry Cattinger got together – and I think it was Jerry Cattinger's car. It was the CLS late models, like a super stock. He went over the wall off of turn two and landed. He There was like two pickup truck pulls of people, and he hit a motorhome. Nobody, I don't think anybody got hurt. I could be wrong on that. But he went over the wall. It's like, man, they're close to the wall. That, that seems just unsafe to me altogether. And mm -hmm. I was down. Oh, to, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. I went down to Talladega, to the Talladega short track. I went to a NASCAR race. I went to the dirt track. And it was a similar deal where they're right on the fence there. But I remember the NASCAR fans being at the dirt track, their arms are through the fence going, woo, and they're waving shirts. And, and there's cars like this far from them. I'm going, oh, my God, somebody's going to get killed. And uh, they do things different down there in the south. I mean, I've even, seen, I've even seen places down there where they allow drinking in the pits but not in the grandstands, which would not work at any of my tracks. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of a unique deal down there. But. Yeah, good to see Billy Moyer back in victory lane. Pretty pumped about that deal, you know. And then, uh, so I think that's kind of it on the late model side of things, you know. And uh, the sprint car stuff, they had the biggest race of the year. And my boy Keith, he's our sprint car analyst. He was all Kyle Larson up coming into this one. Did you get a chance to watch any of the sprint car stuff? Because the World of All Laws stuff was pretty good again. I watched the, highl the highlights and um... – Larson, it watching Larson race a sprint car. When the race is coming to an end, you think he has no. Ch he he has like another gear with on the last lap. I mean, he'll just throw it in there. I don't. I mean, he is very confident in his in his driving ability because he will throw it in there and like just see if it sticks or not. Um, because it. it you know, he wound up finishing second. He didn't. He didn't get the win uh, in one of those races. But uh, you know, he went for it at the very end, and he's very fun to watch. <laughs> well, my my buddy Jeff said this right night one. He goes, you know, Kyle Larson's been dominating on dirt, but he's having some problems with gravel, <laughs> namely <laughs> David Gravel, because a couple times straight, couple straight weekends, I believe he got second. To David Gravel. He was there at the end, but he's been running good. That 41 car has been fast. He won night one, but uh, and that was for 10 grand. Now, on night number two, a guy that we actually, specifically me, I said, you know what? I think his time is done. You know, these young guns coming in, you know, they're putting a beat down on him. Yeah, he's got a bunch of championships in a row. You know, he didn't win last year, but I think Donnie Shots, I think his time is over. And next thing you know, the biggest race of the year, 75 grand to win. Donnie Schatz, the Minot missile, getting it done. So that was pretty cool. And, again, Kyle Larson tried making a late race run, but Schatz knew how to shut the door on that deal. And uh, did you get a chance to watch any of that race? Yeah, I, I saw the end of that race. And uh, um, I think there were uh, some fans in turn three in the infield that also thought that Schatz was washed up. I don't know if you saw his post-race interview. Um, <laughs> uh, some, the comment was something like, uh, uh, he said he tagged the wall because he thought he, he was waving to the fans in, in, uh, in the infield in turn three, because they had told him before the race that, uh, that he sucked. And then he went out and won the $75,000. So he thanked them for, for the motivation. <laughs> yeah, nothing, you need that extra motivation because Kyle Larson, again, got second. So he was right there, and he was coming at the end, but Shots knew where to, where to put that car to make it wide. 
And, you know, he's, he's one of our guys. He's a northern guy, right? He's originally from California, but he moved up to North Dakota. He ran with soda for a number of years. So I kind of look at him like he's a homie, right, because he's, he's a, northern, a northern guy. But great to see shots back in victory lane. Excited about that. You know, now. I see the, the, the points uh, have spread out a little bit now. It used they, to be they really have close. because Schuhart moved back. <laughs> but the, the points have spread out. But shots kind of closed the gap up a little bit because he was yeah, almost 100. And I think, what is he, 75? 70, now? Se 70 now. Yeah, 70. So I think he gained, I believe, 28 points over, and, over the weekend. Schuhart is 38 points back. Yeah, he slid back just a little bit. You know, so it's still, there's still a few races to go. We'll talk about that when we have our upcoming stuff here. But, you know, Overall, the, the late models were, were good racing. There's not a whole lot of racing left. But I the, know. <laughs> the car, that was a big show, 75 grand to win. You know, so pretty fun to be able to watch that, especially when there's not a lot of local stuff going on. It's nice to have them options. Now, the next segment here, rocked to us by Zuli Race Engines. You know, I want to thank Frank. He builds a lot of great stuff. You know, get a, get a hold of Zuli Race Engines. They're over in the western part of Minnesota, I believe. But I know he builds Justin Vogel stuff. Vogel, very fast in that street stock, number 10. But, you know, they build a great product, you know, great customer service. Every I've seen so many people raving about Zuli Race Engines. You know, this is a time of year where people are looking, what are we going to do for next year? We got to get our engines freshened. So, I mean, bring them your engine, get it freshened if, you, if you're looking for a little change. Or if you're looking for a complete different change, give him a call and, and let him build you, build you an engine because he can build some good power that lasts a long time as well. So great stuff there from Zuli Race Engines. But this next segment here is, are you even serious? Really? Did, did you see that deal up in Jamestown? I, I, I did see that. Um, we talked about the Jamestown Stampede last week and how I missed this, but but I'm glad we waited on it because a lot has transpired in a week's time. But, you know, I'll kind of preface it like this, and I'll get your thoughts. There's, a dude, there's this dude up there, and I don't know any of these guys, but I, I watched it, right? So there's this guy up there, A.J. Davenport. He runs a bomber, which is kind of like a pure stock, and evidently he's been having some issues with a guy by the name of John Gartner Jr. Now, like I said, I don't know either one of these people from Adam, but – this guy, Davenport, he wins a race earlier in the year up at Mandan. Normally, when you get out of your car and they're interviewing you, you're, like, excited, you won, you're pumped, you're fired up. And him, he's like, it's like he's pissed off in victory lane. Oh, that guy's been pushing me around, and I didn't take it, and this and that. And he's, like, all mad, and he's like, I'm going to wreck his car, and I'm going to do all that. And I'm like, we're talking, like, there's redneck and there's full redneck, right? There's still, you know, he's, this guy's, like, off the deep end. Well, Jamestown... In, at the Stampede a couple weeks back now, he actually, on the left, the checkered flag comes up. Race is over. Race is over. You can see this right on the video here. He goes into turn one and two. Several car lengths behind this Gartner guy. Drives into his right rear. Hooks him. Spins him. Rolls him. Drives over the top. They roll each other. Or he rolls them both over. I'm like, oh, my God. Are you serious? All right, this guy's completely lost his mind. Well, Jamestown says, you ever want to race here again, here's the deal. You have 10-year suspension from the Jamestown Speedway, $25,000 fine, $10,000 of that goes to Gartner, fifteen to the track. Well, he ain't going to pay that. He's just not going to race Jamestown ever again. He also was registered that night to race in a Wasota street stock. So he got an unsportsmanlike conduct there. He got a $1,000 fine from Wasota and an indefinite suspension from all Wissota racing. So he can't race Wissota anymore either. He has to take, I don't know, he's got like for sure a year, then it's indefinite. He's got to go before the board and kind of prove that, that he's not completely loony bin before they let him back in a race car. And if you watch that deal, this guy's completely off his rocker, like completely. He's got some problems that he needs to kind of figure out because he lucky he didn't kill somebody. And I mean, not, I mean, I don't, maybe that Gartner guy's a hack. I don't know the guy at all. Maybe the guy runs into everything. I have no idea, but you can't be doing that crap after the, after a race. What an idiot. Did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. And uh, I mean, that, it's a bad deal. I mean, you know, we had a long discussion about the, 
uh, Tyler Erb, uh, Bobby Pierce incident. And this is a hundred times worse than what that was. I mean, he makes you know, Tyler Erb look like mother Teresa. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean to hit somebody, I mean, actually where they, it looked like to me where they exit off the track is near turn three. So, you know, they did uh, more than a half of a lap cool down lap when he did this and he hit them hit them hard enough to roll the car over plus drive over the top of the rolled over car and what's amazing is they caught this on video i mean it's in the background but you can see it it happening and when i watched it it was like are you kidding me i mean <laughs> you know i i think there's too much uh, legal stuff in in the country but if anything warrants anything in racing warrants possible legal action, this would be the case. <laughs> yeah, without question. I mean, in all of my years of racing, I've been around racing my entire life, right? And I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. I mean, I've seen people hit people after a race, spin them out, cut their tires, smash them. I've seen all that. But I ain't seen this. I mean, I ain't seen somebody roll somebody over. Then I mean, that was like, and then drive over them like a monster truck. Never in my entire life have I seen anything that is that far off the deep end. And and really, when like you look back to kind of the how the whole series of deals started, you look back to that initial video of him ranting in Victory Lane, right? I'll play the I played the clip here so you guys can kind of watch it. But the fact is, if you pay attention to that. That right there says that guy's got some issue, right? Because I've never seen anybody yes. <laughs> like that kicked off at life in Victory Lane before. That guy somebody somebody definitely needs some uh, anger management classes. Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> if, if he happens to be watching the show um and he's upset about our comments, my name is Puka. Um <laughs> he's, not, from he's not on here, so I'll throw it on him. But, uh, you know, the fact, facts are the facts. He can get pissed off. I don't care if he watches this deal or whatever. You know, flat out, dude, I mean, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. You do not belong in a race car. You simply do not. It's a privilege to be able to race. You know, we live in the, in the best country in the world, right? And we have the opportunity to go race. And we're talking about safety stuff. And you got this clown going out there and doing that stuff. I don't give a crap you know, what kind of beef you have with somebody or whatever, take them all back. You want to throw fists, go, go throw a fist, whatever. But doing this and using your car as a weapon, man, that, that just, that's bullshit. <laughs> is what that mm -hmm. is. No, I agree. And I mean, luckily, uh, you know, there is nobody in that area that got hit. Um, right. Because I mean, the race was over. So, I mean, I've been at tracks where, you know, once the race is over, car starts slowing down, they let people start crossing the track, you know, walking across the track. And, you know, that would have been a really bad deal if, you know, that would have taken place. Yeah. You know, I've seen people at the end of the race, checker flag comes out, they go into one, they come down to two and they're like, all right, race is over. Everything's all done. They start unbuckling their seatbelts and they're kind of, you know, I've seen that you shouldn't do that. Now, if you're a racer, <laughs> like, please don't like unbuckle and stuff till you get in the pits. Right. Because, you never know what kind of clown you're racing against. I mean, if he would have been, if that guy would have unbuckled or whatever, that could have killed him, right? You know, so, yep. yeah, so leave your safety equipment on until you exit the racetrack. That's just the best way. So <laughs> probably, like, probably leave it on until you come to a complete stop in your pit stall. <laughs> well, my buddy Jeff Krause, he was over at the King of Dirt, and he lost his brakes, and he come rolling in the pit and smashed into his trailer, so he probably needed the seatbelts for that. So, <laughs> Jeff, I love you, man. So that's going to bring us to the next segment here, Bert. In the next segment, coming events. You know, we got some things coming up. This, of course, brought to us by our friends at Dirt Race Central. You know, want to thank Ben and John. They've provided great video content here all year long. They really they get to a lot of with soda racetracks. Um, if you if you're not familiar with Dirt Race Central, if you don't have it, it's WatchDRC.tv. You know, get the subscription. You can watch so many races after the fact, and they have a ton of racing action live including this coming week. You know, they're heading over to the Ogilvy Speedway, Ogilvy in Ogilvy, Minnesota, for the Fall Classic. And I'm, I'm kind of pumped up about this one. Are you going to watch that show, Bert? It's kind of the last. There's really nothing else going on in the area. So the Fall Classic is kind of the V show this weekend in our region. Yeah, I don't know if I'll watch it live, but I'll definitely watch it. 
Um, I'm, I may watch uh, also, I mean, 141 Speedway in my side of Wisconsin, they have, uh, uh, they call it a cheater's race. Apparently anything goes. So I'm kind of curious to see, uh, uh, because apparently I, I've seen some rumblings on Facebook that people are getting a bunch of Lexan and all that stuff put together, you know, for sideboards on their cars and stuff like that. So I'm curious to see what, uh, what that all entails. <laughs> well, that's kind of cool because I'll skip a beat back here. I was going to talk to it at the end. Well, we'll cover this later. We'll cover this <laughs> at, in, on the last lap, but Hot Carl was down at a show that kind of had a little bit of that craziness going on. But uh, as far as, so the Cheaters Night deal, is that going to be televised? Is that going to be on uh, anything? I believe it's going to be on Flow Racing. Oh, it is? So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so uh, I'm toying with the... I want to see what some of the contraptions look like ahead of time. I may right. actually go to the race on Saturday. Uh, I'm not sure. That'll be okay. uh, probably a Saturday decision. Right. Uh, if there's right. some wild, if there's some wild contraptions, I may go there uh, to s try to see it live. Otherwise, I'll definitely be watching it on Flow. Well, that, that kind of sounds <laughs> pretty neat. It kind of breaks things up. And you know, getting back to Ogilvy here, last year's winners. You know, you had Pat Doerr, you won the late models. Sabraski won the mods. Moss in the supers, and Sabraski won the Midwest mods, right? So Sabraski got 44. You know, he's going to run a, a modified, a super stock, and he's actually jumping into one of Jeff Provenzino's late models to, to race a late model. He said he ran a late model even before he got into modified. He ran it for a couple nights. He said he was terrible. He didn't. The speed was so much different than what he was used to. But now he's, he's been – Hey, the speed ain't an issue anymore. You know, he's been running a mod. He runs some open mod stuff. So Sabraski's going to be in a late model. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm excited mm -hmm. to watch that show just for that because, you know, the fact is, I mean, the guy's won and everything else. I, I'm looking for him to be pretty darn good. And that Cole provenzino has been running that car. He's been pretty good. So watch. It's actually watchfye.tv, which is still Dirt Race Central affiliated. It's just branded because it's an FYE show. So that should be good. Sabraski, like I said, 44 wins on the year. He needs six to get to 50. He's got his work cut out for him because there's only a handful of races left. And uh, who's your pick in the late models? Um, who, who, who do you think is going to get this one done? Well, I'm going to go uh, say uh, Pat Doerr is going to repeat in the late I, model division. I'm going to go with Massengill. Uh, Massengill was really good there last time. He came from a couple rows back. He got second. He was right on the bottom. His car rotates so good. You got to have that at Ogilvy. So I'm going to take the 6M of Jeffrey Massengill. He's been so good during the invitational season. I just have a feeling that he might be the guy to beat this week over at Ogilvy. We'll find out soon enough. Now, World of Outlaw Lakes, they actually have two weekends off. So they don't, they don't come back and, you know, they got a couple weekends where they're not going to race. And there's only five points races left in the world of outlaws. Brandon Shepard, hugely over. It's over. Brandon Shepard is going to be your 2020 world of outlaw late model champion. Ricky Weiss has a pretty comfortable lead right now over Cade Dillard, who's in third. And uh, what's coming up, Bert, there for the Lucas Oil late models? Uh, Lucas Oil, uh, they'll be racing uh, Friday at the Dixie Shootout, which is in uh, Woodstock, Georgia. And then they'll be on Saturday. They'll be at uh, the Rome Showdown uh, in Georgia. So, uh, and I saw Madden's going to be at both those. I did see that on his Facebook. Okay, I'm not sure where Shepard's going to be racing. He said he's going to be in the five B car. So he may he may be staying closer to home though, because I think there's some Mars races. There is in that there area. Is. Yep. So yep. In the Lucas Oil, uh, the point battle in that there's four races left only. So you got. These two races, and then you've got the, what is it, the Dirt Track World Championships, I think that's called. That's what's coming up uh, coming up next for them. And this one, I said the World of Outlaw Late Models deal is over. <laughs> this one is really over, right? Jimmy Owens, massive point lead. T-Mac, Jonathan Davenport, second and third. That one's over. And that'll be on, I believe that's going to be on Lucas Oil Racing TV. So we'll be able to watch that if you have a Lucas Oil subscription. If you don't, jump on Dirt on Dirt. Um, it'll be on there the next day. And you talked about the Mars deal. This is their championship weekend for the Mars series. And uh, they're going to be in Peoria, Illinois on Friday. And then falls frenzy, baby. Fairberry. <laughs> here we go. Right? So, and with the world of all my late models being off, 
Brandon Shepard, I, I, he's going to be there. So you get B-Shep, you get some of the World of Outlaw guys. I, I would say that uh, Herb, right? Herb, I'm sure, would be Herb there, will yeah. Be there. You know, so you're going to see some of them guys. I'm sure Brian Shirley's going to be there. You know, so you're going to see some of them guys there. Fairbury, Saturday night. Or I believe that yeah, that's Saturday night. Gloves off, fifteen grand to win, and then they're gonna go over to uh, LaSalle. Like, yeah, LaSalle for the championship, which surprises me. Well, the Mars Series is Tony Izzo, sixteenth promotions, yep. and LaSalle closed down. I'm not really. It sounds like there was a little family feud or whatever. But that's right. That, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> little little brotherly love on the front straightaway. You know, we'll talk about anger management issues, Tony. Love you, man. It's all good. <laughs> But uh, the fact is, LaSalle's going to be for the championship. Now, I don't know if Friday night's race at Peoria is um, going to be on anything. I, I looked, and I couldn't find Peoria, but I know that Saturday and Sunday are both going to be on Dirt on Dirt. We'll be able to watch them live, and rest assured, I will be watching Fairbury for sure on, on television, <laughs> for sure. And uh, so I, I'm excited about that. That's, that's always a hell of a show down there. And another thing that's coming up, so you have the Mars. Um, another thing you got coming up is the Tar Heel 50. Um, what did you see on that? Well, that's a series uh, uh, put on by uh, former late model driver Ray Cook, correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, it's the Fall National Series. And uh, so I don't know a whole lot about that, but it it's a good little series that he's put together down there, and he gets some pretty – he gets some decent name drivers to participate in, in his, in his races down there. What I saw on this is, uh, first of all, that race is Friday. It is on dirt on dirt. So the Tar Heel okay. is on dirt on dirt. We'll be able to watch that. Um, last year's winner, Brandon Overton, he won that show last year. And uh, that's at Tri-County Racetrack in Brasstown, North Carolina, night three of six. It's the Shapers Fall Nationals uh, that Ray Cook has. He had the spring nationals. This is a fall national. So he, he puts together a couple little mini series down there. So that'll, that'll be a pretty cool deal. I, I haven't seen racing at that track. So it'll be kind of fun to watch. And, you know, so quite a bit of late model racing coming up, but uh, there's a little, another thing going on right now, as we speak, um, actually they have the October fast is what they call it. So you got the hell tour for the lates and the mods, but they have a six night and six weeks, big block modifies. And I believe that is on Dirt Vision um, because anything, I think, UMP related, I think a lot of that comes, is on Dirt Vision. Yeah, I think yeah. the Hell Tour was on Dirt Vision as well. So the big block mods in action, basically it started on Tuesday, and I think it goes all the way through Sunday. And I think it's like a $10,000 prize to the series winner. I think he chose 7500 to win. So if you have a dirt uh, dirt vision subscription, jump on there and catch some big block modified. So anything else? A lot of racing to watch. <laughs> there it is. There a bunch of late model racing, but I'm I'm most excited personally. I'm most excited about two things. Number one, I'm excited about the fall classic. You know, we're coming down to the end of the year. Ogilvy's a great racetrack. That's a great event, that fall classic, you know, and you know, late models over there, they don't go to the Ogilvy Speedway. That last race they had at Ogilvy, the late model race, was amazing. I think it was Shaw won, Massengill got second. I think the hammer, Daryl Nelson, he got third. And they, I mean, that was a hell of a race. So look forward to some really good racing there. And Fairbury, oh, that just that just gets my blood <laughs> pumping. I'm just, I'm just jacked about that one. What are you excited about that's upcoming there, bud? I mean, Fairbury is, uh, you know, how can you not get excited about a race at Fairbury? We've talked about Fairbury a lot this year. And I mean, I think it's well, they deserve to be talked about because it, the racing there is really good. Um, and with their I announcers, mean, Bert, you could turn the screen off and be excited because their announcers <laughs> for them shows are, they're amazing. I mean, they get, I mean, they're jacked the whole time. So you can literally turn the, you can just listen to it, right? Listen to the footage. And I think it would be exciting that way. And I, I'm looking forward to uh, watching the uh, races at Ogilvy. I mean, as I'm watching more of these races, I'm becoming more familiar with the drivers that race in Minnesota. You know, before I started doing this podcast, you know, I, I knew some of the dri I knew some of the names, uh, but now actually, now that I'm watching the races more, I'm becoming more familiar with uh, who the top drivers are. And, you know, I'm paying attention to, you know, how Sebraski does to see if he 
gets to 50. Uh, it'll be interest, interesting to see what he does in a late model. Um, I mean, well, we had this discussion about Larson earlier in the in the year. I wouldn't I wouldn't expect him to win, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's driving one of Bravo's cars, Bravo. Nothing against you, but you're not Rumley, right? So he's it's not on the same playing <laughs> field, right? No, not many people are Rumley, right? So you know, Kyle Larson had probably one of the sharpest guys in all the dirt late model racing, getting that car ready to go. But uh, it'll be – I think he's going to run good. I really do. Let's go over and under. You know, let's say – let's just go with – I don't know how many cars are going to be there, but I'll, I'm going to pick a number – I'm going to go in my mind seven. Higher or lower? I'll say – I'll say lower. All right. So <laughs> I said he's going to get seventh. Bert's going to go with the under on that one. Check it out. It's going to be watchfye.tv, the fall classic Ogilvy coming up this weekend. So that's going to be good. And then you've got that cheaters race you're talking about going. If yep. you get some pictures or some video footage or whatever, well, you said that's going to be on flow. So we'll be able to have some video footage yep. of that because if there's some pretty unique stuff, it's kind of cool to see that kind of stuff for sure. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, now we're to the last lap. You know, the last lap here of the One to Go show brought to you by the folks at Impact Health Sharing. If you're paying too much for health care costs, get a hold of Impact Health Sharing. You know, if you're not sure how, message us and we'll kind of hook you up or whatever, but uh, save some money. If you've been overpriced on that deal, like everybody in the country, there might be an alternative there for you. But uh, Chateau Speedway, Bert, first of all, Daryl Nelson, I never in my life thought he would go down to Lansing, Minnesota for a show. Fourth the first night, parked in victory lane the second night. Good job to the hammer. But something else happened there. And I got this information. I sent it to you from my buddy Pete. And he said uh, he went down there to watch. He was down there with his daughter. So he brought some fans to the racetrack. He built this pretty cool bus into like a like a traveling deal. It's almost like a motorhome type deal. But he built it out of a school bus. Pretty cool deal. But Pete went down there and he says, man, if the only thing I saw in the whole night was this, and I'll let you talk about it, it was worth it. So something happened. I'll let you fill us in. Are you talking about uh, the feature win by a 13-year-old girl, Kennedy Swan? Yes. yes, I am. So I raced against her dad a little bit. I believe it was Jason Swan. He ran a mod. You know, I, I think I've raced against him up at the Red Clay Classic and stuff. But, yeah, 13-year-old girl. And I looked at her results, Bert, on my race pass, and – most of the year, she was 10th, 12th, 8th, 14th. I mean, didn't look like she was going to win any races. She won that Midwest Mod feature from 10th. Did you watch that? No, I didn't watch it, but, I mean, it's impressive It's impressive to win a feature, even if you're starting on the pole, but to start 10th and, and win the feature for a 13-year-old, you know. 13-year-old girl. 13-year-old girl, right? Yep. And, and, and the, here's – and Pete said, you know, the the promoting of that deal, and she's working through the pack, you would have thought the announcer would have been like, this is a 13-year-old girl, right? And they didn't even know it was a 13-year-old girl until, like, she was in victory lane. Oh, really? So, yeah, they should have <laughs> played that up. That's crazy. And he said his daughter was pretty pumped about that deal. So hats off, Kennedy Swan. Great job. That's exciting. Congratulations on that win. Uh, we're super excited for you and look forward to seeing you maybe get some more wins next year. Um, Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson. Now, I, I have right here that he only had two sprint car wins. I'm wrong. He has three sprint car wins only since racing in the late model. That's it. Is he cooling off? Bert, what do you think? Yeah. It, ru it, it ruined his driving ability. You know, he, he's used to racing a late model. He can't get used to racing the sprint car again. Yeah, no, he's going to be upset think, with us here for talking smack about his man crush. I, but, I don't know. think finishing second is anything to uh, uh, be too worried about. But, I mean, when you're Kyle Larson, you know, he expect, I'm, I'm sure he expects to win every time he's out on the track. So he's probably disappointed with his finishes, yeah, even I though they are seconds. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking you're probably right. I kind of looked at it. It's like he's in a slump while the last three were second, including the 75 grand. But – but he has one twenty grand to win deal after the after running that late model. But he's coming up here is it next a couple of weeks here. He's going to be running a late model um, at the dirt track. I think it's called the Dirt Track World Championships, the Lucas Oil Finale. Okay. So 
We'll see if he can get back into victory lane. I'm kind of doubting it on that one. I, I just – I don't see it, but stranger things have happened. <laughs> and uh, so you had a – you actually – how about Ryan Unzicker? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, he won a ARCA race, uh, the dirt race uh, at the Springfield Mile. And uh, only 18 cars, but, heck, you win a – you win an ARCA race, I don't care how many cars are there. That That's, you know, something to hang your hat on, you know, something to be proud of. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So congratulations to Unzicker. Did you happen to see some pictures? It was a dust bowl. I mean, I, I, saw, saw, some... I saw some some highlights, and, yeah, it, it's a dust bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Haley well, Zagan, she's that's, a, that's another girl. She got second to that deal and was actually – there was a green white checkered finish, and she actually took the. She was in the lead at one point on that green white checkered deal. I mean, that's one thing about uh, when they have a dirt race for asphalt vehicles. It's really not a dirt race <laughs> because they they get it packed down so tight that it's it's like you're racing on asphalt. I mean, I mean, it's still dirt and it's still different, but. You know, it, it's not the sling and dirt like we enjoy. <laughs> well, speaking of that, you know, they made an announcement of Bristol yep. for 2021. You know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, Bristol, they're going to put dirt on Bristol. And uh, actually, the top series in NASCAR is going to be racing on dirt at Bristol. I mean, I'm sure uh, it, it'll draw more interest to that race. Uh, I'm curious to see if the track is, I mean, cause when they would race at Eldora with the trucks, I mean, they would have that track packed so tight that, you know, it's, it's like you're racing on asphalt. So I, I'm guessing that that's probably the way it's going to be there too. Uh, but it's still going to be cool to see them racing on dirt and, the thing that I'm wondering is since dirt's already going to be on that track, is there going to be some uh, national uh, late model or sprint car series who also uh, take advantage of that? <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I, I sure hope so. You know, that's what I'm kind of hoping. I'm really hoping because that NASCAR deal, that's all fine and good. You know, Richard Petty, really, you know, we're going back. I think we're going backwards here. Dirt racing's unprofessional. Really? NASCAR is unprofessional, right? Dirt track, you, we, you, there ain't nobody at the dirt track kneeling during the national anthem. You punks in NASCAR are kneeling during the national anthem and catering and pandering and this and that. You call dirt racing unprofessional? I think it's the other way around. That's just my opinion. What do you think? Well, um, well, I sent you a text on Sunday that uh, NASCAR has some, some stupid rules. So <laughs> I, I think they should worry. Richard should. Richard Petty should worry about some of the NASCAR rules they have. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but uh, at at the end of the race, uh, one of the I can't can't I can't pronounce his last name Benedetto or he yeah, was ben Benedetto. Benedetto, yeah, he was racing for the lead and he was doing what any driver in the lead would do. One thing that I hate that drivers do is block he was trying to block and nascar ruled that he by him trying to block he forced a car below the double yellow line so they put him to the last position on the lead lap but the thing that irks me about that is he could have spun a car out he could have put a car into the wall that wouldn't have mattered he would have been able to keep his spot but because he forced someone below the yellow line, he gets penalized. To me, that never, just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I never thought about that. You know, you're exactly right. I thought, I think the blocking deal is stupid, that rule running him down. But you're exactly right. I mean, you could yard sale somebody under the fence, wreck yep. half the field, barrel roll somebody, and then be like, well, you kept going, you get your spot. So, yeah, right. yeah NASCAR <laughs> kind of drives me insane. You know, we. I think uh, – you know, it's one thing to take the NASCAR guys and bring them to, like, Eldora or Bristol. I say we, like, tell them to leave their purses at home. We bring them boys over to Fairbury, <laughs> and now we can see what they're made of. That's what I'm thinking. But another thing about Richard Petty saying that d racing on dirt is unprofessional, how many wins does he have on dirt? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, I mean, exactly. That, that, that go towards his 
record 200 NASCAR wins. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Funny how, funny how they forget over time. Speaking of NASCAR, your home state, the NASCAR race next year. Talk, what, talk, talk about that. Yep, uh, the NASCAR schedule was announced, and uh, I know Road America has been trying for a long time to, I mean, they've had the Xfinity, Xfinity series there, um, but the top uh, NASCAR series will be coming to uh, Road America next year. They'll be racing on July 4th, um, so it's good to see Road America get the cup date. Uh, Road America is always a great sponsor in Full Throttle Magazine, so I'm very happy for them to uh, to uh, get this cup date. That's pretty cool. Are you going to go to that? Uh, I was thinking. I was thinking about that today. You know, maybe I've never been to Road America, and yeah, what better either. what better time to go than to to see the top division race there. Right. Well, you know, they're not bringing modifieds there. That's it's NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing, uh, hot car. We talked a little bit about. You said the at 141, they're going to do like a cheater night, and I actually jumped on Hot Carl's page on on Facebook for all the. I mean, if you live underneath a rock, it's Hot Carl Chassis. He's got some great videos. Pretty much everybody in dirt racing knows exactly who I'm talking about. But he went down. He brought his dipshit pit guy DJ down there. And I know that uh, Tito, buddy of mine, Tito Viltz from Rice Lake, they went down, made the trip down to Texas. And I didn't catch on what the heck they were doing. But they went, it's, it's called the Lone Star 600. And it was like two back-to-back -back races. I think it was Friday, Saturday. And they were 300-lap races. And I believe, I think is what it was. I think it was a 300-lap race. And it's a run what you brung. I mean, there's mods, late, super stocks, beaters, I mean, you name it, and spoilers on top, and kind of like a big giant enduro, and I mean, he went down, and he's doing videos, and what was cool to me, because I, I know Hot Car, a buddy of mine, right, that guy's like rock star status, that guy's like a freaking celebrity, because they promoted the fact that, hey, Hot Carl's coming down to this, they actually promoted the heck out of the fact that he was coming, and I saw a video, Kenny Wallace was visiting with them, and he's like, Kenny Wallace was starstruck of Hot Carl. And I'm like, that is cool. Because Kenny Wallace is a <laughs> hell of a TV personality, race NASCAR, you know, great guy. We had him on the show. But he actually was starstruck over Hot Carl in the presence that he has in the sport. He's done so much good. But it was pretty cool to be able to watch some of that stuff. There was a Hot Carl car. He saw Hot Carl stickers all over everything down there. And he's like, Ryan, he goes, we need to put something like that together up north because that deal was cool as hell. Totally different deal, but he said it was pretty darn cool. Bobby Pierce was there. Um, Kenny Wallace ran in that deal. So it, it was a pretty neat deal. Did you get a chance to look at any of that stuff? No, I didn't see any of that stuff. But I, I just want to say, you know, going to a Run What You Brung show is, is pretty cool. I don't know if you went to the one at Monster Hall when they had that one. Had to have been at least 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, Steve Larson won. He had a sprint car wing on the top of his car uh he had, it was funny because uh i mean i interviewed steve larson for a dirt uh, late model article and i asked him about that and he was very forthcoming uh about his experience there i don't know if you want me to share that right now yeah, or yeah absolutely. okay um well i mean he had a sprint car wing on top of his car and he had a sprint car tire on his rear I'm assuming it was probably the right rear. And, um, well, the funny thing is he said the sprint car tire that they used, they had for a while, and they were using it to roll jugs of fuel off of the back of a pickup truck. You know, you let it fall on the tire to, to break the fall. But anyway, he had uh, problems in his heat race. The motor just wasn't running right. Um, so then he had to um, go through the B main, uh, won the B main, had to start in the back of the A main, and just crushed the field. <laughs> it's amazing how much that wing makes a difference. But he was telling me that he had parked next to, because Brian Burkoffer was there, and that's when Burkoffer was sponsored by Sorbert. And th this was a race sponsored by him. And uh, he was talking to Berkey before the race, and Berkey was asking him about the wing and stuff. And apparently Berkey said, are we in trouble? And Steve said, yep, you're in trouble. 
<laughs> nice. You know, I, I remember the swing modifies back at Cedar Lake, and that was I thought that was cool as hell. But you could flat foot them things, is what I was told. I mean, there there was so much traction and downforce, almost too much if you didn't know what you were doing. But pretty cool deal. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about that deal at 141. And uh, if you if you get a chance, Bert, jump on to Hot Carl's page on Facebook. He's okay. got lots of videos that he did from that. And uh, he covered that very well. And, again, you know, Hot Carl, that's a thumbs up right there because not only is he fun to watch, but the things that he's doing for the sport right now, it's creating excitement. It's creating a buzz. And the sport needs that. So I, I'm super mm -hmm. proud of him, super proud of the following that he's got. And he's selling a hell of a lot of merchandise. And, you know, get your hot, hot Carl gear. Get it now because uh, it's going to run out fast. So Yeah, at, at the 141 deal, the Cheaters Night, uh, they're actually, uh, I think it's like $100. Uh, they're giving away $100 to the most unique ideas uh, in each division. So, it, nice. so I, I would imagine some drivers are going to try to come up with some pretty cool stuff. I, I'm looking forward to it. Make sure to get some pictures, maybe Facebook Live from there if you go. Do a pit walk. That's what I'm going to say. Do a pit walk, do a Facebook Live, and, and give us some footage on the One to Go Show page. I'm looking forward to that. And speaking of unique stuff, unique cars, um, did you see Ricky Weiss's new paint scheme? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, you probably know more about the significance of the colors than what I do. Yeah, just to, I just know a little bit. I just read up on it. They said, basically, it's a, it's a cancer research tribute body. Um, I don't know a lot of the backstory, but Dry Bean is sponsoring, and they're going to match his winnings up to $10,000. He's going to run that the cancer tribute body through the end of the world of outlaw season, and the money is going to the V Foundation for Cancer Research. So that's pretty cool. You know, just another way that the racing community gives back, right? And then Dry Bean, they keep throwing money in there, and they're kicking back to that deal too. The question I have for you, Bert, is – that's another die cast right there. Is you get you have to find out. Is he going to get a die cast of that tribute body? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll have to find out if he's if he's getting one done. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it's a cool looking body because one side is pink. I'm assuming that's uh, for breast cancer awareness, and then the other side is like a aqua or bluish green, if I'm not mistaken. And, and I'm sure I'm not sure which cancer that uh, signifies, but I'm sure it's something on the male side so uh you know it, it's a cool looking car yeah it's pretty cool you see a lot of that i've seen that a lot in the sport where a lot of different tribute stuff and you know stuff for leukemia i've seen stuff for cancer i've seen i've seen lots of different stuff out there so just that's why it's so great to be part of the racing community and speaking of die cast i'm looking behind you if you're a if you're a madden fan you're gonna have to have a case just for just for his <laughs> stuff because he gets a different body, seems like different car, all that different sponsors like once a month. So like every single year, like if JC Norgard, he does his calendar. So get a hold of JC because he's got some pretty cool calendars. <laughs> a little shout out to my buddy there. Like you'd have, he can do a month probably just of the Chris Madden stuff, right? Or a, a year, I mean, they're one per month. Well, on the Chris I, already stuff. Bought, I already bought his Bloomquist car from earlier this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot of them. I don't know if he's got a die cast for every one, but my goodness, if you're a die cast collector and you're a Chris Madden fan, you're in big trouble because you're going to spend <laughs> a lot of money trying to keep up with that guy. So, so yeah, so that's, that's about what we got. So, I know that you're you're kind of a daytime. I think you should head over to that deal just just for the show. You should go at the very least to get us some video footage because I want to see a pit walk, especially if there's some cool stuff. Um, I'm not going to any races um, live this week, and I'm heading back to Illinois. I'm, I got a few things going on, but I will be catching some action live. Of course, I'll be watching the Fall Classic from the Ogilvy Speedway Friday and Saturday on Dirt Race Central. And I'm going to also be watching. I'll, I'll be that guy with multiple windows open because I'm super jacked up to see Fairbury. Any picks before we end the show here for Fairbury? Well, it's hard to go against Brandon Shepard. If, I'm assuming he'll be there with the B5. He said that he was going to be racing the B5, so I'm assuming he'll, he'll stay close to home. And So I'll take Shepard. I've been talking smack about this guy all year long about being not so smooth. But uh, I'm not sure if he's going to be there or not. I'm kind of thinking he probably will be. And if he is there, I'm taking Bobby Pierce. Because you give that guy a cushion, both of them guys are fast. But 
Pierce is – he came from pretty deep at that last one up into the top five, and I think he might be due to win one over there. So I'm taking the, the – the not so smooth operators who I'm taking. So, so with that said, that's another episode. Glad you guys uh, got to watch the show. You know, we're here at the One to Go show. That's Bert Lame, and I'm Ryan Aho. And as our long lost buddy Puka says, "Go out there, be your dream." Thanks for tuning in to the One to Go show. Yeah.